Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Bonjour. So the presentation will be in French. No problem? Yes, no, it'll be in English, but you'll have to, uh, of course, listen to my French accent. That's the uh, counterpart of uh, delivering the speech in uh, English. So I decided actually to uh, choose uh, the following title for my presentation. Do we face a major crisis or are we just talking about growing pains or just uh, a crisis which is normal when you are still an adolescent? Um, really, reading the press or listening to the radio in this part of the world about Europe is a very, very interesting experience for someone like me who spent all together five years in Brussels uh, working um, at the French uh, representation to the uh, EU. Europe is only described through another European crisis, a crisis at its borders with a massive influx of refugees, a political crisis with the referendum of the United Kingdom, called Brexit, as you know, economic difficulties, lack of accountability, and so on. So it's a rather desperate, actually, picture of Europe that I can read uh, from this part of the world. So my talk today will hopefully take you to a slightly different uh, direction. And uh, well, will tell me after, um, after the lecture. As you know, uh, France is a founding member of the EU and remains strongly committed to the European project. Europe somehow is part of our DNA. We are the geographical center of Europe, the largest country in terms of size, the second in terms of population, and this is very interesting, together with Ireland, France is the only country in Europe which population is still growing i.e. because of the number of children that uh, I, we um, <laughs> produce every year. We are, of course, a member of the uh, Eurozone. We do have 74 MP within the European Parliament, and uh, we also have a strong voice on foreign and military policy issues. So, therefore, we have some really good reasons to support the EU project. The real question, therefore, is do we face a crisis, a total collapse of the project, or is it just a normal growth crisis, an adolescent one, which in a way is a normal phase into the development of the European project? So I would like to uh, take you uh, along that, uh, that road with uh, uh, in three parts and each time I'm trying to f uh, tell you about some very very concrete examples so to have a presentation which will be as concrete as possible so the first part I would like to uh, explore with you is what is exactly the European Union you all know about the European Union but what you might not really realize is that um, the European Union is a unique economic and political union between 28 uh, European states. And I would like to give you um, two examples to show you that it is still you know, a living project. And the two examples that I have chosen are trade and the fight against climate change. So first of all, let me state that the European project is, of course, very much alive. There are, there are no discussions of dismantling uh, Europe uh, whatsoever, and that this project has been ongoing, it's a living, really, project since uh, its conception in 1952. Growing from six to 28 countries is definitely not a small achievement, and you have a European population now which is over 500 million people, so it's quite a big number um, uh, in the world of uh, today. The project, of course, is still very attractive because when you looked at you know, the number of uh, countries knocking at the door, so Europe is still a magnet for quite a number of countries. For example, Turkey, Albania, Montenegro, Serbia. And you probably don't know, but even New Zealand actually would dream to become a EU member, as John Key said it the other day at a breakfast with the, uh, my uh, uh, colleagues from the European Union. He literally said that if the European project, you know, was 
a project in Asia Pacific, in the Asia Pacific region, he will join. So I think it's probably, you know, the best supporter ever uh, that we could get for that project. So looking at trade, the European Union remains not only the largest trading powers, around 15% of global trade for goods, around 25% of uh, global export for services, but it is also the most active in terms of negotiating FTA. Do you know that we have already 60 FTAs, you know, uh, in place, um, well, that we have implemented in Europe? And we have no intention, of course, to slow down the rhythm or our ambitions. For example, as a sister or brother to your TTPA, EU is negotiating um, with the United, uh, with the, um, United States, what we call the TTIP, and the two most recent additions to the pipe are future negotiation with New Zealand and Australia. So therefore, you know, it's still a project which is really lively. There are some issues, of course, when we're dealing with trade matters, but these issues are not only European issues. You also have the same issues. You look at the TTPA, and these issues are what? You first have an issue of transparency, and that was one of the big issues for the TTPA. It might also be an issue for uh, our TTIP, but it's not, you know, uh, Europe which is uh, responsible for that. It's more the US, if I may say so. Um, and the second issue that uh, we are encountering and that New Zealand also has been encountering through uh, the TTPA is the question of um, these negotiations are becoming more and more technical. Uh, so dealing with technical issues is never something which is easy. So you have to explain and explain and explain again. And at the same time also all these free trade agreements nowadays are dealing with what I would call collective preferences, i.e. the choice by, by each country to deliver, for example, health services to protect IP, and therefore we are talking about choices which are very close to the people. So therefore, that's another reason also why we need to explain more about the objectives of the um, free trade agreements. Do you also know that, you know, uh, related to trade, the EU is providing about half of world development aid, over 56 billion euros. So uh, the same can be also true for the fight against climate change. Europe, in a way, has been a leader in the fight against climate change, which, as you know, you know, threatened to destroy our environment, the future of small island states, the sustainability of our resources, and will wait anyway on uh, the future uh, generations. The Paris Agreement, which was negotiated uh, last December, sets out a global action plan to keep global warming well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels, was a major achievement, not only for France, because we were the uh, host country and we were also chairing the conference, for Europe and for the world. More than four years of preparation tough international negotiations. And that's interesting also to note that it's in a way, you know, people were complaining about the fact that diplomacy was no longer uh, uh, something useful. Well, when you look at the outcome of uh, COP21 in Paris, it is an outcome of the merits of global diplomacy. So that's a living example of what diplomacy can achieve. So uh, in the run-up and during the conference, the EU forged alliances with developed and developing countries committed to the most ambitious agreement possible. The so-called high ambitious coalition of countries was key to the successful outcome of the conference. The European Union therefore is and will remain the global leader on climate action. The Paris Agreement reflects this ambition worldwide. It includes all the EU key objectives. First, a long-term objective for a low-carbon society, a five-year review mechanism strengthening targets over time. Second, a global commitment to help countries to fight climate change, over $100 um, billion uh, um, dollar, uh, a year from uh, 2020 uh, on. Three, a bridge between today's policy and the long-term goal of climate neutrality by the end of the century. 
So the, um, this is, you know, not small achievement. And there also you can see that the, Euro the uh, European Union was paramount actually in getting uh, the deal uh, done. Just some figures uh, that you might uh, need to remember. Um, the EU has committed to lower uh, gas emission by 40% by uh, 2030, year of reference 1990. It's important because many countries don't have the same uh, year of um, reference. Europe has also committed to raise a share of renewable energy to 27% by 2030 and to increase energy efficiency by 27% by uh, 2030. So here again, Europe you know, has been a strong leadership domestically and internationally. 